Today marks my first State of the Union address to you, a constitutional duty as old as our Republic itself. President Washington began this tradition in 1790 after reminding the nation that the destiny of self-government and the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty is finally staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. For our friends in the press who place a high premium on accuracy, let me say, I did not actually hear George Washington say that. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> Although I've been around for a while, I can remember when a hot story broke and the reporters would run in yelling, stop the chisels. <laughs> but I am aware of my age. When I go in for a physical now, they no longer ask me how old I am. They just carbon date me. The story was an American and a Russian arguing about their two countries. And the American said, look, in my country, I can walk into the Oval Office. I can pound the president's desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running our country. And the Russian said, I can do that. The American said, you can? He says, yes. I can go into the Kremlin, to the General Secretary's office, pound his desk and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way President Reagan's running his country. <laughs> Less than one family out of seven in the Soviet Union owns an automobile. Most of the automobiles are driven by the bureaucrats. The government furnishes them and drivers and so forth. So an order went out one day to the police that anyone caught speeding, anyone, no matter who, gets a ticket. Well, Gorbachev came out of his country home, his dacha. He was late getting to the Kremlin. There was his limousine and driver waiting. He told the driver to get in the back seat, he'd drive, and down the road he went. They passed two motorcycle cops. One took out after him. And pretty soon he's back with his buddy, and his buddy says, well, did you give him a ticket? And he said, no. Well, he said, why not? Oh, he says, too important. Well, he said, we're told to give anybody a ticket, no matter who it is. Oh, he said, no, no, this one was too, I could. Well, he said, who was it? He said, I couldn't recognize him, but his driver was Gorbachev. About three dogs, an American dog and a Polish dog and a Russian dog. They were all having a visit, and the American dog was telling them about how things were in this country. He, he said, you know, you bark, and you have to, you bark long enough, and then somebody comes along and gives you some meat. And the Polish dog said, what's meat? <laughs> the Russian dog says, what's bark? <laughs> has to do with the fact that in the Soviet Union, if you want to buy an automobile, there is a 10-year wait. And you go through a, quite a process when you're ready to buy, and then you put up the money in advance. So there was a young fellow there that had finally made it, and he was going through all the bureaus and agencies that he had to go through and signing all the papers, and finally got to that last agency where they put the stamp on it. And the man then that had made the final stamp of the paper, taking the money, said, all right, come back in 10 years. And, get delivery of your car. And he said, morning or afternoon? <laughs> and the fella, the fella said, well, 10 years from now, what difference does it make? He said, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> but I remember the story of a fella who was running for office as a Republican and he was in a rural area and it wasn't known to be Republican and he stopped by a farm to do some campaigning. And when the farmer heard he was a Republican, his jaw dropped and he said, wait right here till I go get Ma. She's never seen a Republican before. <laughs> so he got her, and the candidate looked around for a podium from which to give his speech, and the only thing he could find was a pile of that stuff that Bess Truman took 35 years trying to get Harry to call fertilizer. <laughs> so... He got up on the mound, and when they came back, he gave his speech. And at the end of it, the farmer said, that's the first time I ever heard a Republican speech. And the candidate said, that's the first time I've ever given a Republican speech from a Democratic platform. <laughs> and 
the great things about having you here is that I get to tell a farm joke. <laughs> now, first, I need a setting, but um, uh, Rick, uh, you're from Kansas, right? You bet. Okay, this takes place in Kansas. Uh, there was an old Kansas farmer there. He had a piece of creek bottom land that had never been developed at all. It was all rocks and brush and all messed up. And he started in on it, clearing it, the underbrush and hauling away the rocks, then cultivating the soil there. And he planted a garden, everything from vegetables on to corn. and and. Uh, it really became a garden spot, and he was pretty proud of what he'd done. So one Sunday morning in church after the service, he asked the preacher if he wouldn't stop by to have a look. Well, the preacher arrived, and he took one look, and he said, Oh, this is wonderful. He said, These are the biggest tomatoes I've, I've ever seen. Praise the Lord. He said, Those green beans, that squash, those melons, he said, the Lord really has blessed this place. And look at the height of that corn. He said, the God has really been, been good. And the old boy was listening to all this, and he was getting more and more fidgety. And finally, he blurted out, Reverend, I wish you could have seen it when the Lord was doing it by himself. <laughs> and he was on the stand, and a lawyer said to him, while you were lying there at the scene of the accident, didn't someone come up to you and ask you how you were feeling? And didn't you answer that you never felt better in your life? Well, he said, yeah, yes, I guess I remember that, that happening. Well, later on redirect, another lawyer was asking the question, and he said, what were the circumstances when you gave that answer as to how you felt? Well, he said, I was lying there, and he said, a car came up, and a deputy sheriff got out. He said, my horse was neighing with pain and kicking, he had two broken legs. The deputy sheriff put the gun in his ear and, and put the horse out of his misery. He said, my dog had a broken back and was whining with pain, and he went over, did the same thing, put the, there and shot him. And then he came over to me and said, now, how are you feeling? <laughs> a businessman who, just down at the entrance of his building, there was an elderly lady selling pretzels, and every day he'd go by and he'd put a quarter down and never take a pretzel, go on in. He was being very charitable, and this went on for some time. And he came along one day, put down his quarter, started, and she took him by the arm. And he looked at her and he said, oh, you probably want to know why for this full year I've been leaving 25 cents on the plate and not taking a pretzel. And she said, no, I just wanted to tell you that pretzels are 35 cents now. <laughs> And as he was falling, grabbed a limb sticking out the side of the cliff and looked down 300 feet to the canyon floor below and then looked up and said, Lord, if there's anyone up there, give me faith. Tell me what to do. And a voice from the heavens said, if you have faith, let go. <laughs> he looked down at the canyon floor and then took another look up and says, is there anyone else up there? Reminds me a little bit of the story of the man that took his young son-in-law out and was going to introduce him to golf and told him all that he had to do and teed up the ball and the kid took a swing and he missed the golf ball entirely but hit a ant's nest there and into the air and so lined up and took a crack at it and again hit another gouge out of the ant's nest and now there were ants flying all the way through the air and as he lined up for the third try two ants peeked out of the crater that he'd left and one of them said if we want to survive this we better get on the ball <laughs> i've always thought of the importance of communication and how much a part it plays in what you and i what all of us are trying to do and one day a former place kicker with the los angeles rams who later became a sports announcer danny villanueva told me about communications he said he'd been having dinner over at the home of a young ball player with the dodgers the young wife was bustling about getting the dinner ready. They were talking sports, and the baby started to cry. And over her shoulder, his busy wife said to the ball player, change the baby. And he was a young fellow, and he was embarrassed in front of Danny, and he said, what do you mean, change the baby? I'm a ball player. That's not my line of work. And she turned around, put her hands on her hips, and she communicated. <laughs> She said, look, Buster, you lay the diaper out like a diamond, 
You put second base on home plate, you put the baby's bottom on the pitcher's mound, you hook up first and third, slide home underneath, and if it starts to rain, the game ain't called, you start all over. <laughs> I know it's getting late, dear, but it's not often that we have so many people who've written about us and broadcast about us <laughs> all together in one room like this, and I thought you might like to say a few nice words to them. They're all from the press and radio and television. Maybe just a friendly little greeting would do. <laughs> How about just a f word or two, something friendly, even one kind word? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. 